Hi, my name is Janet, and I'm going to be going over some tips and tricks to identify Frugianus hawks and other species you might encounter in a Frugianus hawk survey this summer, this spring and summer. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to recommend a couple of field guides if you don't already have them. The Sibley's Guide is really great, has some really important, really good uh, illustrations and range maps included in it. National Geographic also makes great uh, field guide. Uh, in the last few years, I've also used uh, some different apps from, on my phone as well, too. I like Audubon Birds because it's free and it's comprehensive. And Merlin Bird ID is, all, is also kind of fun to play with because it'll actually walk you through a set of filters and then give you a recommendation of what your bird species might be. So it can be really helpful for IDing uh, birds you're not familiar with. Uh, the Sibley eGuide is also very comprehensive and can be installed on your phone uh, and comes at a price. Some of the commonly common species that you might encounter during spring surveys include Furishness hawk, great horned owl, Swainson's hawk, red-tailed hawk, and uh, common raven, Canada goose. Uh, the first four are the most commonly found birds uh, you see on surveys, and then sometimes too, observers will see osprey, bald eagle, and golden eagle nests too. So starting with Frisian's hawk, uh, because this is our focal species, um, they can be identified when they're in flight by looking at the rusty feathers um, on their legs, the rusty colored feathers, so they're up to kind of rufousy red, um, rufousy brown. And when they're in flight, they form a V uh, that can often be seen as they fly overhead. So here's a V here, and then here's another view of that V that can be seen when they're flying over. Uh, for me personally, I actually find that um, the top view as they flap down or if they're baking uh, when they're in the air, uh, much more identifiable than that V. I just don't see it. So what I use instead are these window panes that are these white patches that are on the primary feathers um, that contrast against the brown that's on um, these uh, uh, shoulder feathers and on the outsides of those primaries and secondaries. And so as they are flying past, you'll often see this contrast. These wind white window panes go by. And it's large, it's contrasty, and it's distinctive for Frugianus hawk as well. Um, other identifi identification traits that can be handy for Frugianus hawks are their white underparts. So they're very uh, clean looking white with some rufous coloration as well too, rusty colors. Uh, and then they also have rusty colors on their wings and their backs as well too. And so here's another view of those rusty feathered legs too. Here is a view of some light morphs and some dark morphs. So here are some examples of those birds uh, in flight where you can see those white window panes. Uh, even from a distance, they can be really distinctive. Uh, so here's another one where you can see that contrast of the white on the primaries relative uh, to the, fe the feathers that are higher up on the shoulders. And then sometimes you do see dark morphs uh, in the study area. And dark morphs uh, still have sort of a similar looking face to uh, Frugianus hawks with a big gape, but distinctive from a distance, they have these light two-toned wings. So they have light secondaries um, uh, and primaries, and they have dark uh, have a dark inner region that contrasts very nicely. And so here is another example of a light outer parts and then dark inner parts here. A Frischnus hawk um, often has a really, well, I find that they have a really distinctive looking face, especially compared to other hawks you might encounter like red-tailed or swainsons. So first of all, Frischnus hawks have really large gapes, so they have a long, uh, long mouth relative to these other hawks. Um, so you can see in these pictures here, I've sort of measured out how far that gape is, and it goes from the tip of the beak, and it almost ends past the eye or at the end of the eye. And this huge grin is very distinctive on both light morph and dark morph Frugianus hawks here. So you can see the bright yellow contrast and the extent almost to the end of the eye. For the light morph Frugianus hawks will also have these like very light, fine streaking on their heads as well too. They have a very bright yellow sear, so that's this patch, fleshy patch that's above their beak and above their nostrils. Uh, and it's very um, noticeable from a distance because it's so large and it's so brightly colored. Uh, Frischnus hawks also have a white chin that turns into a white chest, so it's a nice smooth transition between, and that's going to be important when we compare their faces to Swainson's hawks and red-tailed hawks. So you can see these grin, that gape length, goes quite a ways back to the ends of their eyes.
So when we do compare them to a Swainson's and a red-tailed hawk, um, then you can see that Frugida's hawks have a really large beak relative to these other two hawk species. So they have long beak, and it also goes to um, the far goes the farthest back on their heads as well too. So the Swainson's has the shortest beak. Uh, because they often eat, they're more adapted to eat insects. So they have a short hooked beak that ends almost at the start of their eye. And then you compare that to a red-tailed hawk that has sort of a medium-sized beak that goes a little bit um, past the start of the eye, but not quite as far back as what, would, what you would see on a frugianous hawk. Frugianous hawks, um, if it's a well-established nest that's a couple of years old, can be pretty distinctive looking as well, too. Uh, first of all, they're composed of sticks that are usually larger, chunkier, just bigger bigger sticks in general. Um, and if it's a couple of years old, these sticks, um, these nests have been built upon years and years, and so they kind of have a flat-looking top with really rectangular, straight-looking sides as well, too. So less oval and more rectangular, and very they can be very, very large. When we contrast Frugian's hawks to Swainson's hawks, the first thing that we should note is that these birds, the species, arrives a little bit later than Frugian's hawks. These guys are uh, migrating back from Argentina compared to Frugian's hawks that are just coming from southern states and northern Mexico. Uh, we expect to usually see Swainson's hawks in late April to early May. So in flight, Swainson's hawks are thankfully very distinctive. So they also have two-toned wings, but opposite of what you would see in a dark, more frugianous hawk. Uh, so on a Swainson's, um, they have kind of a cookie coloration, an Oreo cookie coloration I like to refer to it as. It's two-toned where the inner feathers are light and their outer feathers are dark. And it can be seen, um, this contrast can be seen from even quite a distance. Swainson's hawks also have uh, this chestnut bib that has a pretty strong line that c cuts between it, and um, it's very distinctive uh, in flight or when they're perched as well, too. One of the finer differences between Swainson's hawks and Frisian's hawks are these stouter wings that Swainson's have compared to longer, uh, longer kind of um, more extended wings on a Frisian's hawk. One of the things I also find useful for Swainson's hawk, especially if it's in the distance or if the lighting is tough, is that they have a patch of white forward of the tail, in front of the tail, on the back, uh, that's not... Um, not too different from uh, what you would see on Northern Harrier. If you've seen a Northern Harrier fly by, on the top view they have a very large square of white um, that's very contrasted uh, against the rest of the body, and it's just forward of the tail and at the lower back. Uh, Swainsons have something similar, except it's not quite as large and square looking. It's more of a small, thin, white crescent, but it's distinctive on Swainsons hawks and uh, can be useful if they're flying away from you. You often see Swainsons perched as well too, and often because we're looking at birds sitting in nests, we'll often see them perched, uh, or just the top half of their bodies. And so, as I said before, Swainsons hawks have very short beaks relative to other, uh, relative to Frugia's hawks and, sw and red-tailed hawks as well too, and it's because it reflects their insectivorous diet. Swainson's hawks also have a very distinctive white patch that's above their, above their beak and they're above their sear as well, too. This is important because you often only see from kind of like the forehead and up of a bird if they're sitting low in a nest, and that white patch that's above their sear can be really helpful. Swainson's also have a white chin that turns into a dark brown chest. Uh, and chest bib on, on these birds as well, too, which is important because Frugia's hawks have a white chin, but that turns into a white chest as well, too. They don't often have this dark bib. In comparison to Frugia's hawks, their nests uh, are made of uh, much finer, wispier, thinner, delicate-looking sticks compared to a Frugia's hawk nest that often is made, out of a, made up of really big, robust, stout-looking sticks. Uh, so that can give you a little bit of a hint of what you're looking at as well, too. Great horned owls are commonly found nesting in these big stick nests on the prairies, uh, and I find if you don't see their face, which is pretty distinctive, you often just see their backs um, or their side views. It's this light gray coloration that's very different from any of the other hawk species, from any of the other hawk species that we uh, find on survey. So they're often light gray that are patterns of this variegated look to them, versus hawks like uh, red tails and swainsons, frugianous hawks that would be a dark brown or rufous or patchy with light and brown but compared to gray on an owl. Uh, often, too, well, great horned owls will have uh, these feathered ear tufts, and they have facial discs that can be seen as well, too, and bright yellow eyes um, that are forward-facing. Um, these, all these traits together tell you that these, this is a great horned owl. 
Um, but here are some other views of what you might see for a great horned owl in a nest. Here's a really common view uh, where you can see these ear tufts and those facial discs. But just the overall coloration, the quality of the color is very different from what you would see compared to those other hawks. Red-tailed hawks are pretty common uh, out in parts of uh, the study area as well, too. And as they're flying by, the bottom view has a couple of distinctive traits that you can use. Uh, one of the best traits that are that's really consistent across most red tails are these potassial um, dark leading edges on the wings, so these dark shoulder patches that are there. Um, and they're seen in different forms of red tails and can be quite distinctive as you see them fly by as well, too. Uh, another trait that I like to use is the belly band that goes across the belly. Uh, here's a more distinctive one on this one, uh, and it's often visible um, when, uh, even though they're high up in the air. Uh, one of the tough things about red tails that live in Saskatchewan, though, is that their tail through uh, their tail isn't actually that old of a red, and it can be often a really light colored red um, that barely looks red at all depending on the lighting. And so I tend to use traits like those leading edges, those um, dark patches there, or the belly band um, that help you ID a red-tailed hawk. In comparison to to a fruitless hawk and swainson's, their heads are different. Um, where fruitless hawks would have a white chin to a white chest, and a swainson's has the bib. Red-tailed hawks have just a dark hood that goes over their head and again has a really um, contrasted line that cuts between their head and the rest of the chest. And so they've got this brown hood over them that can also be seen from a perch position and in flight as well too. We'll often see red tails perched uh, in trees, on power poles, and so forth. And so learning to ID them from the sitting position is important. Uh, their heads are quite a bit different. Their beaks are uh, shorter than a Ferruginous hawk uh, beak, but longer than a Swainson's beak. Um, and um, there's very little yellow on them. I actually find them kind of bluey gray looking. Uh, and they also have a very heavy looking eyebrow, and this is a great example of what a heavy eyebrow would look like on a, on a red-tailed hawk, uh, compared to Swainson's and a Ferruginous hawk. Uh, when there's, if you have a front view of them, they'll have that belly band that goes across the front, um, but a really common view is them turned away from you, and you often see their back. But one of the distinctive things that I see on red tails is this rough looking back V that's on their on their back and so they're generally pretty dark brown but they've got often these rough looking white feathers that form a V as they're sitting. So here uh, is a view of a red tail sitting in its nest and it's it's sort of an in-between bird because um, compared to a Swainson's nest that's often made up of really fine looking small delicate twigs and the really robust stout looking sticks that are in a fruitless hawk nest, uh, then red tails kind of have kind of the in-between nest which isn't particularly descriptive. Uh, because we're doing nest surveys, then often the view that we have of birds when we find them is um, just the top parts of their heads, and if we're lucky, their backs um, as they're sitting in, in a nest, either laying or incubating. Uh, and so it's really important to have just a list of traits to look for when you just see their heads and their backs. Um, and things to compare between these three hawk species include looking at the beak length, the color of the steer, the chin coloration, and the length of their mouth, the length of that gape. So here in a Ferruginous hawk, we have beak length, which is a really big beak, long beak that extends very far out that you can actually see um, as a big beak in a silhouette, even if the bird's under shadow. Red tails have a medium length beak, and Spainsons have that small insectivorous beak that again is distinctive even in silhouette as well too. The color of the sear, so that patch above their beak, above their nostril, can be important uh, because Frisius hawks have a really large one that's often bright yellow compared to just a bluey gray, almost green, that's on a red-tailed, and the smaller patch that's on a Swainson's hawk. Chin coloration is different across these three birds as well, too. Uh, so Frisius hawks often have that white chin that turn into a white chest. Uh, Although it's tough to see on this one, red, red tails have that brown hood that goes over their head. And then I think what's most distinctive on is compared is, is the Swainson's hawk because they have that white patch above their sear and that distinctive white patch, chin patch, um, before it turns into that dark bib on the Swainson's.
So here's a table to be able to compare some of these things across uh, the three species. And I've also noted things with the D um, for traits that are retained even when the birds are dark warps as well too. So this might be a handy chart to take out to the field with you and just use as a checklist to, to uh, filter out what, what you might be looking at. You might also encounter Canada geese out on surveys because they do nest in big stick nests um, off the ground as well too. And um, sometimes it's not that as easy as you think it would be to identify a Canada goose up in a tree nest. Uh, but I find that the, the color of brown on their body is very different colored brown than hawks, and that it's very light, um, sandy kind of color versus dark browns and rufuses that are on three hawk species, and that light variegated gray that's on a great horned owl. Uh, if you're lucky, you might be able to see the long neck and a black and white head. That would help you uh, ID uh, Canada goose. Other species you might encounter include a common raven. Uh, so these birds often sit much lower in the nest compared to some of the other hawks. Uh, they obviously have a dark head and dark body, and then they also have a large, large beak as well too compared to those hawk species. And sometimes I get a little bit um, confused when I see a common raven beak in a nest because I'm not expecting it. Um, and what it looks like to me is a very dark bird sitting in shadow, um, but then I realize that it's actually just a dark bird. Um, and so if you start to think um, and you're looking at something that is just overall much too dark sitting in a nest, they consider that it might be a raven. Uh, observers have also come across osprey uh, bald eagles and golden eagles in nests too. Um, and um, these are some species that you can consult your field guide for for, for helpful ID traits. Uh, Really commonly across parts of the city area as well too are black-billed magpies, and these guys build a large, round, dome-like nest that usually have an entrance or two. Uh, and we're not going to be recording magpie nests, but it's important to know what to look for um, uh, to just s separate them out as magpie nests. So I've put together a quiz um, that uh, shows some tough but also realistic views that you might encounter when you're out doing Frucianus hawk surveys. Uh, so birds might be in the distance, they might be behind branches, it might be windy and so forth, so it can be pretty tough. So um, give these a try, and we'll talk about the ID traits that can be useful as we go. So this is a Swainson's hawk. Um, it's not the best view of it, but it's a realistic view of what you might encounter. So this is a Swainson's hawk because you can see that it has a yellow sear, but it also has a small beak too, relative to a large beak on a Frugianus hawk and a really large sear you would also see. Uh, this bird also has a little bit of white that's above that sear and a bit of white chin as well too that turns into a dark chest bib, uh, which... Um, Frisian socks would have a white chin that would turn into a white chest, and they wouldn't have this white patch above their sear either. So this is a red-tailed hawk, and this is a tricky one because it's a very nondescript looking bird. Um, it's a bit of a darker view as well too, which sometimes if the bird's backlit, it can be tough to pick out colors. Uh, but we do, what we do see from this photo is that bird, this bird has a pretty strong eyebrow. It doesn't have a bright yellow sear. It's pretty nondescript, and so it would be a bit more visible if it was a Frugia's hawk or a Swainson's. And it doesn't have a very large beak like a Frugia's hawk, and it doesn't have a very small insectivorous beak like a Swainson's either. So these three things tell us that this is a red-tailed hawk. This is a Frugia's hawk, and it uh, has a bright yellow sear that you can see from quite the distance. It has a lot of rust color on its wings. And it also has a really large beak, especially compared to Swainson's and, er, and, compared to Swainson's and red-tailed hawks. It has a large, long gape that goes past at least the midpoint in its eye, almost towards the end. And this bird also has a white chin that's turning into a white chest as well, too. It also has very light, fine streaks on its head. And combined, all of these traits tell us that this is a Frugianus hawk. So this is a great horned owl uh, nesting on what is a uh, artificial nest platform that was supposed to be for a Frugianus hawk, but they'll do that. 
Uh, so here in this view, we can see those feathered ear tufts. We can see a little bit of those facial discs um, on its face as well, too. And just the overall coloration is a lot um, lighter gray, a little bit um, variegated as well compared to those even browns on a Swainson's or the browns, the rough looking back on a red tail to our Frugianus hawk. So we're going to level up and pick a couple harder views of some species. So this is a Frugianus hawk as well. So while we could only see its head and a little bit of its back, we've got enough here to tell us the story. So we can see, uh, even from a distance, that this bird has a bright yellow sear um, that's quite large, and it has a really large gate that goes all the way back to the end of its uh, end of its eye. Uh, it has also a large beak relative to the small insectivorous beak on a Swainson's and that medium-sized beak on a red-tailed. Um, and it has a little bit of streaking that you can make out on its head as well, too. But for me, I often see this big grin and this big yellow sear on its nose that tell me that this is uh, a Virginia's hawk nesting on a nest platform. So this is a Sphinxin's hawk. This is a pretty typical view as well too, where we can see that it has a pretty small beak very insectivorous looking beak. This bird also has a white patch above its beak and a white chin on it as well too. And from this view, even if we don't have a very good view of its face, we can see that the back is pretty evenly dark brown, uh, which is pretty distinctive of the Swainson's hawk relative to the other hawk species and to the other uh, raptors we might come across like owls. This is a red-tailed hawk. Uh, this is a little bit of a trickier view because I just find red tails pretty nondescript um, when you're just looking at their heads and their chests. But there's enough here to tell us that um, this is a red tail. So for starters, it doesn't have a bright yellow sear. It's pretty nondescript looking in terms of the beak. It's not too big or not too small, um, and it's kind of bluey gray. So for us, that for, so that tells us that this is a red-tailed. Um, we also have a pretty good view of the whole head here, and so we see that it doesn't have any uh, chin patches or patches above its beak, and it has a dark chin that doesn't turn into a white. It has a dark chin as well, so it has quite something that looks quite like a hood on its head. Uh, so this is a red-tailed hawk. So we're going to pick some even harder photos, um, but again, these are pretty realistic of what you might encounter in the field. So this is another Frugian's hawk, and this is admittedly a pretty tough view, but again, it's realistic. Um, but we've got we've got some information here to use. So we can see that it has a little bit of a sear. You can't quite see the sear. There's a branch right in front of it, but you do see a large, bright yellow gape that goes quite a ways back on its head past the eye. This head also is lightly streaked relative to a... Um, Swainson's hawk, which would be uniform dark brown, and also to a darker brown of a red-tailed too. This is again another tough view. So this is a Frisian's hawk that's nesting, that's built a nest in a nest basket. Um, but even though it's quite hidden and behind some branches, uh, you can see a bit of that bright yellow sear that it's above its beak. And you can see that this bird has a white chin that, tran um, that transitions into a white chest as well. So if it was a Swainson's, it would have a bib, it would have um, a white patch and a white chin. And if it was a red-tailed hawk, it would have a dark hood with a white, with a light chest. But it has that chin and chest that's both white.
So it's probably pretty obvious that this is a Canada goose, but it's always good practice just to, to remember that you can find them. Uh, so here's a good photo, though, to show that different quality of brown compared to some of those other hawk species that we encounter. Uh, so they have a really light, sandy looking back compared to those dark browns or the rufuses that we see in other hawks. Um, in this view, we can see that it's got a long neck and a black and white head. So this is an osprey, and um, while sometimes we just see their heads as they pop up from their nest, that's usually good enough if we have a good view of it, uh, because osprey have that dark stripe that goes through their eye. This is a great horned owl nestling, and um, this time of the year when we're out doing Frugia's hawk surveys, we'll probably encounter uh, some great horned owl nestlings along the way. So they're often pretty white and gray, still quite fluffy at this age, with maybe some primary feathers developing, um, but they're still pretty pretty downy looking. Um, and they have sometimes ear tufts, they sometimes see a little bit of the facial discs that go around it as well too, uh, and that, those forward looking eyes that are quite yellow. Um, but um, it would be mindful because to keep these in mind because often the adults aren't on the nest and they just might be nearby. So that's a tough one, but that's a red-tailed hawk. Uh, and again, it's a very nondescript looking bird, which tells me that it might be a red-tailed hawk. Uh, so from this view, you can see that there isn't really any yellow that's on the beak or the sear. It's almost bluey gray again. Uh, so it's not yellow. Um, which tells us it's a red-tailed. From this view as well too, you can also see this bird has a pretty strong eyebrow on it uh, relative to uh, Swainson's and Afrisian's hawk. It's got a very strong eyebrow. And it doesn't have a white chin, it doesn't have a white spot above its nose, so it's not a Swainson's hawk, um, nor a Afrisian's hawk. Um, and so we would guess that this might be sort of a hooded head, um, which again would tell us that it's a red-tailed hawk. So, that was a pretty hard quiz, but it's probably realistic of what you're going to encounter. Um, the good thing about hawk, hawk ID, especially when they are sitting in a nest, is that you can take your time with it because they're not likely not going anywhere. Um, and again, as I've said before, sometimes hawk ID can take 30 seconds, but it can also take 20 minutes or even longer as well too. Because sometimes you just have to wait the hawk out and uh, wait for its head to come up to look around, or maybe even look around for other birds that might be in the area. Um, it's if if it's pair, if it's mated pair adult is nearby um, or comes comes closer. Um, Hawk ID definitely gets um, easier with more practice and so as you do more and more surveys and you see more and more stick nests with birds, I'm sure that your identification skills are going to improve uh, as the hours and the days go by. Um, and it can actually be really fun because it can be really challenging as well too. Uh, but certainly it can be frustrating and that's very, very normal. But I would expect that um, Everybody's going to improve and hopefully have a good time out there and get a lot of practice because they're going to find hopefully a lot of hawk nests. Uh, so thanks very much and I hope everybody has fun. I hope everybody finds a lot of hawk nests. Thanks very much.